This is the uh, uh, He Who Fights Monsters panel, and I'm your uh, host, Paul Roberts. I'm the editor at ThreatPost.com. Uh, we're a security news blog. And um, we have a great panel today who I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, just a couple seconds on the ground rules uh, or uh, kind of how we're going to frame this. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel members. Uh, we have a few slides uh, kind of uh, germane to what so each of the panel members are going to say, um, and uh, then we, we really want to take questions from you, but we only have an hour, so actually what we're going to do is hold questions for the, there's a Q&A session uh, after this in Pavilion 4, which is two doors down on the right, I hear, and we're going to uh, take questions uh, there in the Q&A room afterwards, okay, uh, and I know there are a lot of you who, who have questions that you want to ask. Um, but, uh, you know, the time, the time for our panel is, is short. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm Paul Roberts. Uh, my introduction to this, to, uh, well, Anonymous and Aaron Barr and H.B. Gary obviously came as a reporter and Threat Post covered uh, this story as it was breaking, as did a lot of other folks. Um, I got to know Aaron personally. Uh, he reached out to me after I, I wrote a uh, uh, kind of an editorial piece called uh, Winning the War and Losing Our Souls, uh, which was uh, written uh, at the time of the RSA conference. Uh, and if you remember, H.B. Gary kind of pulled out of that conference at the last minute after all of this stuff broke. Um, and uh, Aaron reached out to me after that editorial, and you can Google it. Um, I think because I was probably one of the few journalists who actually expressed sympathy for him uh, and, and what he had to endure as a result of the attack by Anonymous. Um, uh, and, <laughs> uh, you know, we all fuck up every once in a while, right? Um, but, but most of us don't have Stephen Colbert kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> riffing on our, our fuck-ups in life. Um, and Aaron, unfortunately, did. Um, and uh, he, uh, at, at that time, myself and I know Josh, uh, thought about... Uh, DEF CON is a great way to kind of come back to this issue, uh, hopefully with Aaron in our midst, uh, to figure out what it, what it all meant. Uh, and Aaron also, to his credit, very much wanted to do that. Uh, unfortunately, um, attorneys got involved, in particular attorneys for H.B. Gary, uh, which uh, put the kibosh on that plan. Um, and uh, they contacted uh, Aaron, they, uh, you know, basically threatened a lawsuit if he were to appear in this panel. Uh, they called his new employer uh, and let them know that they would be you know, pursuing legal action. And you know, Aaron's a guy who's got a wife and kids and a mortgage, and uh, we, all, we all know how that works. Um, but I want to, you know, just in the beginning of the panel, sort of uh, give props to Aaron Barr for uh, having uh, at least uh, the courage to you know, put himself out there and, and propose to come up here, even if uh, the lawyers kept him from doing it. Um, okay, let me, um, let me introduce the, uh, our panel members, uh, uh, starting from the left. Uh, Josh, Corman is, <laughs> uh, Josh Corman is the um, uh, Director of Security Intelligence uh, for Akamai uh, Corporation. Uh, he says, unless you have plans to attack him, in which case he is the Research Director uh, for the Enterprise Security Practice at the 451 Group. Uh, <laughs> Josh has more than a decade of experience with security and networking software, for real. It's a real decade, not an eight-year decade. Uh, and most recently serving as, uh, uh, before uh, enterprise security practice, a research director for the enterprise security practice, before that, a principal security strategist at IBM Internet Security Systems. His research cuts across sectors uh, to the core challenges of the industry and drives evolutionary strategies, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Jericho, to his right, uh, has been poking around the hacker security scene for 18 years. That's a real 18 years, okay? Not, not the kind of 18 years that are only 12 years. Uh, building valuable skills such as skepticism and alcohol tolerance. Uh, <laughs> which he's put to the test at this year's uh, show. As a hacker turned security whore, he has a great perspective to offer uh, unsolicited opinion on just about any security topic. He's a longtime advocate of advancing the field, sometimes by any means necessary, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, and he thinks the idea of forward thinking is quaint. We're supposed to be thinking that way all the time. Uh, um, no degree, no certifications, just a willingness to say things that most industry is thinking, but unwilling to say themselves. He remains a champion of security industry integrity and in small, misunderstood creatures, and uh, you can find him at attrition.org. All right, yeah, it's here for attrition. <laughs> to his right, Baron Von R. <laughs> He's worked as a security professional for 13 years. That's a real 13 years, Baron? 
uh, both for and with IT firms, including IBM and Command Systems. He's currently working in incident response forensic security auditing at a leading aerospace company. Barron's expertise includes ethical hacking, pen testing, social engineering, inf uh, information security audits, computer forensics, stenography, uh, open source intelligence, and the like. Uh, okay, so he's, he's ready to weigh in on our panel as well. And who is Baron von R? I don't know, maybe you're gonna find out. Okay, um, here's our uh, Twitter handles. <clears throat> that Baron von R Twitter handle isn't real, so don't try and follow him. Okay. I'm gonna pass the mic over to uh, my esteemed panel member, Jericho. Yeah, so to put this in perspective, uh, raise your hand if you're not an asshole at some point in your career. Uh, I see one, one hand, go ahead and leave, please. <laughs> We prefer no liars. Uh, how about if you don't profit from your security work? Yeah, okay. And then, <laughs> Somebody raised their hand back there. <laughs> another liar, yeah. And so how about if you think you know the whole story behind the H.P. Gary saga, or if you, you think you even know half of the anonymous saga? Oh, one hand. Yeah, look, go ahead and get the hell out, liar. Or wait, is that Aaron Barr? Second over here. No. <laughs> those, are both, those are the threat post readers, actually. Okay, Aaron. Do, do you want to come up and be a panelist? Make, make sure you go to the room after this. Let's talk. Okay. So um, after that, does anyone want to admit that they're part of H.B. Gary? Or H.B. Gary Federal. Or Federal. They're different companies. Yeah, I know, different companies. So uh, I know it. Huh? Do they pay you? No, but I have emails. <laughs> so, okay. When was that email address created exactly? <laughs> I've had an okay. email address there since February. So that, that narrows it down. We do have one member of Anonymous in the group. <laughs> uh, confirmed. <laughs> well, he says, I have an email address at HB Gary and I don't get paid by them. <laughs> So think about those questions because a lot of what we're, uh, as a group and as an industry, are leveling accusations at Aaron, you know, that was really kind of a lot of the criticism and we kind of forget to look at ourselves and say, you know, I'm basically halfway to the monster that we claim he is. Okay. Mr. Corman. All right, is this thing on? All right. So. For those who don't know philosophy yet, the rest of the whoever fights monsters is that should see to it he himself does not become one. And um, I saw quite a bit of cognitive dissonance over, geez, you know, that 17-year-old anarchist in me wants to join a non-ops. And, you know, the, the guy protecting a Fortune 50 network or so wants to fight them. Um, and I basically thought it was useless to talk about white hats and black hats and gray hats. And, you know, you dust out your advanced Dungeons and Dragons and essentially it's not just a good versus evil thing. I mean, some people see Anon as Robin Hood, right? Chaotic good, Arab Spring, freeing oppressed people, transparency for the win, right? Other people see it as the Joker, chaotic evil. They just want to see the world burn. You know, so what we tried to figure out is the conversation wasn't moving forward, so I just dust, dusted this thing out. And, and the real defining characteristic isn't good or evil, it's they're chaotic, right? So we have a, a, a rise of the chaotic actor, so to speak. And uh, most of the confusion or debate is we're romanticizing about the positive or, or attractive aspects of this, uh, but we're not being very deliberate about which roles we want to play. Um, and we're going to get to some of that searching your soul. I mean, that was the point of your article was, um, as we're fighting this, are we losing our soul? And uh, Aaron's a, a living embodiment of even, he even violated his own personal ethic in some of his actions. And we just get so caught up in the activity that we, uh, we're not in control of it, but rather a victim of it. So try to figure out through the course of this where you fit on here, but more importantly, where do you want to fit on here? Because in our pursuit to raise security awareness or improve security, we may actually be driving something far worse than the Patriot Act, right? We may cause powerful and uninformed people to act in powerly, powerfully uninformed ways. And real quick, he didn't uh, realize it when he made the slide, but the uh, boxes that actually have a hat, those are off limits. None of you in this room fit any of those bills. So figure out which of the other six boxes you are. Great. 
Baron, any thoughts? Well, I'm kind of in the middle of the whole thing. Uh, from a perspective of the government and the intelligence agencies, all of this kind of activity, especially on Aaron's part, is a part and party of what we've been doing since the beginning, since the forming of this nation, disinformation, intelligence gathering. So what Aaron did, yes, it kind of crosses the line when you start to talk to a company or a, uh, in this case, a law firm that's going to go after individuals within our own country. Even the CIA was in charge to do that. Uh, so yeah, in my book, he crossed it. But as Richard Thiem said in uh, his Black Hat, Black Hat tutorial, it's all gray. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. You just have to know where you sit, and you have to come to grips with it. OK, thanks. Good thoughts. Um, I think I'm going to start just with a, a, I think probably the, the, a question that the answer of which will maybe help us understand where each of you guys come from. But who, who is anonymous? Uh, in, in your minds, uh, whether that's who they are literally or who they are kind of symbolically? I'll take a stab, but um, I think people <clears throat> think anonymous, uh, well, first of all, there's probably several participants in the room, maybe even on the stage. And, um, and it's not a group, right? I mean, we know this, but I'm just to tell you things you already know, anonymous is not a group. Essentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's like Taylor Rental branding. It's a franchise. I mean, some people that, that took the name were doing things like Arab Spring or something locally. It was just a way to, to it was almost like a post-secret, right? Um, it was a way to do something without getting caught, maybe as a whistleblower, and it, could, it can form a, a very valuable part of our culture. Um, I think it was kind of hijacked by smaller groups, um, and now it's become something that's maybe gone from public benefit to public menace, depending on who you are. Um, I think my personal disappointment is if, in fact, you think this is going to make security better by showing failure, um, I doubt it, right? Anybody that's done work with Fortune 50, Fortune 100, CISOs, they're not going to make, they're not going to do better security. I, they're going to do more <clears throat> security. Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that pointing out failures is not going to help security? Oh, no, 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 no. All right, look, look, let, me re, let me refocus this my actual point. Any cause will have an effect. It just may not be the desired effect. And if we're going to do this, hey, if we're going to have chaotic actors, I don't think we're going to eliminate, nor do I want to eliminate participants throughout that grid. Um, I would like to challenge that if we're going to do something like this, let's, uh, let's, let's up our game. You know, why don't we have a lull sec that targets child exploitation sites? You know, anybody following the gesture, why don't we have more people doing things to map out or DDoS jihadist websites? Um, we have an opportunity to not just cause chaos, but cause directed chaos, which is kind of an oxymoron. But if, in fact, we feel powerless that PCI has hijacked our industry, if, in fact, we don't feel like we can actually get our jobs done because management won't listen, there might be more constructive ways to channel that angst. I think that was an excuse, though. I think they just took that up after originally saying that they just wanted to smash things. So to make it have some sort of legitimacy and to maybe, when they do get caught, have some sort of case to make in court, saying we were doing this because we believe in this. I don't believe that's the case. Uh, and I think it's been hijacked completely now, all the way up to the nation state level. So we have actors in many countries attacking many different things, and they could be just red cells that are working from it within other governments' intelligence groups because they're anonymous. And even after qualification, I kind of disagree. I mean, how many of us have been in the industry for long enough? And it's like, you know, you work 40 to 80 hours a week and you're banging your head against the wall and you're getting paid to do it and they're still not listening. How long do we have to go through this before, you know, we actually affect change? You can do pen tests for 15 years and go back and like every six months you retest and it's like, wow, you know, you still didn't fix this remote service. You still didn't, you know, uh, sanitize input here. You're not learning your lessons, so maybe it is time for Anonymous or LulzSec to come in, take these companies, bend them over and fist them, and wake them up. Yeah. <laughs> I, w I would agree with... It's kind of, kind of Anonymous as a business model, right? Kind of. I would agree there's a need, but I think that the companies will just go back to their somnambulism 
the sea levels will just go back to playing with their iPads and their new toys. And they'll, you know, go right across the policies and say, eh, it's not for me, I'm a sea level. So no matter how scared you make them, they're just going to fall back into old bad patterns. It's not going to make a change. So, okay. I'm not going to for a second say that there isn't the opportunity for something, some, some, some way to change the game. What we're doing clearly isn't working. Um, I've seen the reaction of, of victims of Lulset, and they're not getting smarter. I guess that's my point. It's that I think there's the opportunity here to catalyze a different conversation, to drive things forward instead of just banging your head against the wall for 15 years. I'm just not seeing that message sent equals message received. In fact, you look at the Sony thing, because of the earthquake happening and costing them far more damage and financial loss than the punishment campaign and sustained raping of what, 23 on your last count on your website? Yes. Best timeline of the Sony Ponage campaign is on the attrition site. But um, that almost made us go from, just think of a timeline. We went from uh, unmotivated and ignorant of the, of the chaotic actors or, or of exploitation to aware and motivated straight past that to hyper aware and numb, right? We've gone from inaction of one kind to inaction of another. It's actually not really hurting Sony that bad. As, as much as it, like, we felt like, yeah, yeah, rah, rah, we showed the, the weakness in their security posture, this is a rounding error on the losses they had from the earthquakes. It's a rounding error. And my fear is that, again, powerful and uninformed executives are going to look at this as a highly acceptable loss. So I'm not saying don't do this. I actually like lots of aspects of this. I think it could be channeled into a catalyzing event. But if it's simply some reason to ignore our entire industry, then we fucked up. Well, you say that you know these companies aren't learning, and for the most part, you're right. But just as an example, so Sony, they get bent over in all kinds of creative ways, and that's right after they fired all kinds of security staff. Well, are they learning? Well, maybe. You know, there was someone very high up in the the Sony security uh, job line that was at Black Hat. Well, why would they send that person here? You know if they had fired security staff and didn't care. Maybe now they are saying, well, okay, it might be worth, you know, this security thingy that, you know, we hear so much about. Now, I mean, this is going to take people like myself and others to help control the narrative. I hope the press helps control a responsible narrative. But a good lesson that Anonymous and Molset could have done with Sony, and what I'm trying to focus away from how were they pwned, because who cares? There's a million ways to pwn them. Uh, here's a good takeaway. If you sue a researcher who finds a vulnerability in your platform, you're going to get raped, right? I mean, if you haven't figured out the ideas behind, you know, coordinated disclosure or that those kinds of actions have negative consequences, we've now upped the ante. So one thing they may learn is don't frickin' sue researchers. So if we can steer the lesson instead of just hope that attacking them teaches them something. Okay. We have to follow that up. Right. So, I mean, you know, there's obviously there's a long and proud history of hacktivism and, and you know, you can look at, um, you know, you can look at groups like uh, Electronic Disturbance Theater, um, Legions in the Underground, Cult of the Dead Cow, Federation of Random Action. Um, you know, many of the hacktivist uh, uh, incidents that have been, you know, documented or that we can point to are in support of political causes, human rights, and so on. I mean, I think that's sort of what Josh was getting at uh, when he was talking about building a better uh, anonymous. You know, there, there, are, there are certainly no shortage of issues out there that, that uh, technically adept and inform people can uh, support. Uh, uh, or encourage. Um, I guess the question is, is anonymous this? I mean, if you look across, you know, we're talking about both Tunisia and Egypt, those operations, but also Sony. Okay, so Sony was really about Geohot. Uh, HB Gary was about them being pissed off that they might get doxxed. Um, you know, what is the connecting threat? What is the... <laughs> what, what's, the ide what's the ideal that ties us all together beyond we could do it and we did? What's first crack? Baron? Well, <clears throat> I'd just like to go back to the last point for a second. It's no coincidence that uh, hacking insurance is up. So I think a lot of companies, and I did hear about one in particular yesterday, I'm not going to mention them, but they laid off a bunch of people in security and they bought hacking insurance. I'll give you $100 right now if you name them. How many people have hacking insurance in the audience? <laughs> uh, so back to, what was the question? 
<laughs> the I forgot. No, uh, the question was, um, look, again, there, the, you know, we can look back historically and see incidents of uh, ideologically motivated hacktivism, uh, again, whether it's in, in, in opposition to China in support of Myanmar, uh, against the Republican Party, yeah. uh, God bless them, uh, or, or what have you. Um, but when you, look at, when you look at Anonymous, when you look at Anonymous and LulzSec, um, it's harder to discern what the message is. Certainly, you know, Operation you know, Tunisia and Egypt uh, seem like pretty straightforward hacktivist, mm. you know, examples of hacktivism. I would, I would Sony, I, I don't know, you know, um, and H.B. Gary, almost certainly not. Well, I would say that uh, in the genesis of Anonymous, you had the fight against Scientology. They actually had people who were involved in the groups who were involved in Scientology. They had friends, they had family who were getting, you know, taken right. away. Scientology, right, right. So that was the start of it. They fought a giant entity with a lot of money and a lot of lawyers with an anonymous, you know, attack. That led on to, you know, this whole era of spring. Um, they're trying to do something good. They're trying to set up comms in places that are, you know, shutting down internets. Um, but when it started to diverge into anti-sec, lull-sec, whatever you want to call it, right before H.B. Um, Gary, it became something completely different. And I'm not sure completely of the motivations to start. I know that Aaron had said things. He had said them publicly on the news, and they didn't like it, and they just took him down. His fault, frankly. Um, after the spool came out and everything started to come out about what they were doing, yeah, a lot more people jumped on the bandwagon. But after that, Lulstech really seemed to kind of lose its aegis. Um, now they're just hitting the Phoenix PD because they don't like the way the Phoenix laws are on immigration. Well, you know, I don't like them either. But outing law enforcement officers who are bound by duty to, uh, to actually carry out legislation that a legislator has put together, they have no say over. I mean, other than one, mo one vote per person, you're just putting them in danger. A CI list recently came out evidently too. I haven't seen it yet. But, you know, there could be people in danger now because their names are known as CIs. I also know there's a lot of practitioners in the room. You know, we like to break stuff in part of our persona. And he mentioned Richard Thiem. I mean, he's going to present again today, I believe. But if you haven't seen him present before, first of all, you need to see him present. But second, he's, he's really resonating with a lot of the themes that went into the preparation of this panel. But in your day job, right, you've, you've been working really, really hard to try to make sure you can accomplish your mission. And when you see these really high profile, high visibility, noisy attacks, it's going to cause the shift of focus there, right? Now, guess what? I don't really give a crap if they stole a bunch of credit cards. I'm, you know, there's been very little negative consequence to, to the loss of a highly replaceable credit card. What I really care more about is losing intellectual property. It's the irreplaceable. So this is actually distracting you from your core mission, just like PCI is distracting you from your core mission. So your executives are distracted from risk management to PCI. Now they're distracted from risk management to loud, noisy DDoS attacks. What's actually going to put your organization out of business or cause layoffs, it's the loss of those irreplaceable assets. So we're, we're now have a new noisy thing that distracts us from the actual mission we have. Now, you, we didn't bring it up yet, but I mean, there were groups that were taking down child exploitation sites. Anybody in here like child exploitation? It's okay. If you do that. <laughs> Not really. But anybody in here, you know, that, that's something we could all get behind, right? But there was a group, at least one group that I knew of. EHAP, back in the day. Like, let's up the game, right? Um, there's some bad people doing bad things. There's, I, I, I don't know, raise your hand if you dislike FUD in our industry. Okay. Oh, raise, come on, more hands come than that. Come on, <laughs> wake up, guys. Now, are, have you ever encountered a vendor that was totally full of shit? Okay. Hell, let's just have a medium-grade nobility of a, of a, a chaotic group. How about we have a published treatise that if you do any of the following definitions, of three, three definitions of FUD, the, the, the cause of these three things will lead to the effect of a three-day DDoS campaign and DDoS campaign. And we will basically have a disincentive and deterrent for bullshit vendors 
spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. In short, Anonymous needs to make a menu, you know. For the appetizer, I'll take a two-day DOS, you know, then the breach. <laughs> and I'm not even advocating vigilantism, right? But I don't think it's going to go away. It's more a matter of if we think this industry is dysfunctional or we don't think we're being heard, let's have a more strategic and intelligent approach to it, right? If you don't do these three things, you will never hear from us. If you do these three things, here's exactly what will happen to you. Um, I think you may have more chance of random chaos motivating stupid fear to very targeted cause and effect may actually modify behavior. But I'll go, go ahead. I'll go and advocate vigilante justice in some cases. I'm fine with it, you know. Um, once again, if Anonymous is taking request, uh, attrition, we keep a list of companies that have uh, legal threats against researchers. You know, so someone finds a vulnerability or some new cool bypass and a company swoops in and says, you know, if, if you publish, we're going to sue you. Well, there you go. There's your top ten list of companies that really need to be bent over one way or another. And the same goes again for H.P. Gary. They need to be taught another lesson. You know, threatening to file an injunction against Barr for talking here. Um, something about free speech comes to mind, but I don't know the exact quote. You know, so H.P. Gary now, not only are you a bunch of assholes that said, oh, wait, no, that's H.P. Gary federal, not us. You know. So, yeah, they laid all the blame on Aaron Barr. Oh, he's the mega asshole. But wait a minute. Now that he's gone, you turn around and you show that you have, you know, I want to say a more evil streak by trying to limit him. And, um, you know, again, Paul covered this. I understand why Aaron backed out. And the kind of neat part is that uh, originally there's two times he tried to back out of the panel. The first right. time he resolved it. Um, you know, he talked to his new employer and he still made the effort to get on the panel. And that was really cool of him. And then the second one was, you know, it's too much. Like I said, wife, kids, mortgage, he's got too much to lose now. So, you know, just, just take it all into account and consider the entire picture as much as we know of it. Yep. And, and I want to talk about H.P. Gary because I, I definitely don't want to reward them for, uh, you know, suing Aaron off our panel and, and, and trying to, you know, squelch discussion of, uh, you know, what, what was revealed by the hack of that company and what came out of those emails. So we are going to talk about that and we're not, we're not going to let H.P. Gary kind of get away with stifling that discussion. Um, uh, but uh, just to follow up, I, I'm wondering when you're talking about, you know, anonymous, anonymous or something like it as a, as a tool to enforce um, be, best practice, I guess, in a way. Drink. You, huh? You said best practice. Okay. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, but you know, aren't isn't what we're really isn't what you're sort of sketching out a, a, a kind of vigilanteism? So you know, it's it's like um, uh, you know, as as uh, somebody said to me yesterday, it's it's like the you know the Clint Eastwood movie. You know, sort of Clint Eastwood comes into town, but of course you never know what town Clint Eastwood's going to come into. You know, you never know where he's going to choose to you know enforce order or enforce his version of order, and you may not agree with his version of of That's order. Right. But I guess I'm acknowledging that this is happening, um, and I'm being put my big boy pants on and saying it's not going to go away. Um, I mean, just look at what's happening with within a non-officer lulzsec. I mean, they're turning on each other. We now have topiary and custody, custody, custody if you believe it's topiary. And, and there's good evidence that it is. They're going to lean on him. They're going to squeeze him. He's going to turn. I mean, some of the doxing events we saw were basically rifts within the group. So when you don't have an organizing principle, when you don't have a, a mission or a goal, you're just kind of doing shit, um, it self-destructs to a certain extent. So I think there's an opportunity here that if, if the real driving force was that you think security sucks and you want to make it better, that's an if, right? It's a conditional statement. I'm not so sure that the current you know, 1.0 or, or 2.0 is working. Do you think the information that came out of the attack on H.B. Gary, including the, inform the, 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 the plans, Team Themis, uh, and, and uh, the, the back and forth with Hunt and Williams and, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, did the, the, did the transparency that we as a community gained about that, those types of dealings uh, justify the attack? And, and a second question might be, do any of you think that the, the, the harsh light of daylight that was, that was shown on those types of dealings have curtailed those types of contracts, projects, negotiations, discussions, either within the Beltway or anywhere else? 
It's been going on for a very long time in the private sector. Private sector intelligence is a very, very big business. Before Z, before Blackwater. Many former intelligence operatives go into business for themselves and do black ops type of work for companies inside and outside of this country. So it's nothing new. It's just somebody got their hand caught. That's all. Well, I guess the real question for the audience then is the whole H.B. Gary saga when we learned what they were doing, who was actually surprised at anything they were doing, proposing, or just spitballing? Who was honestly like, wow, I've never heard a company do this? I think I saw one hand, and that's good. Because like you said, this has been you know, a multi-million, if not a billion dollar business. The thing is, we just don't know all the companies that have been doing it. They just haven't hit the news. Mike? So, <laughs> yeah, we were in a hurry. Yeah, so the question is, why, why do we listen to this guy if he's not willing to show his face? Shall I unmask myself? Are you a thought? Are you a bad? Well, wait. Wait. Okay, so we have two different opinions, but then the question becomes, you know, who listens to LulzSec? When they say we hack something, but they haven't actually released the information, who believes anonymous when they say something? Let's do a quick show of hands, though. Who thinks uh, we shouldn't listen to a fucking thing he says, because maybe he's a Fed, maybe he has an agenda. We don't know who the fuck he is. Why should we listen to him? Who thinks he should unmask? Raise your hand. Come on, be more courageous. Only a couple people? Okay, just to make sure. Who thinks he should stay masked? I think this is what they call a self-selecting population. <laughs> so, real quick, that, that's an excellent question, but it goes back to why does someone need to show their identity if they're making good points or if they have relevant experience, you know? And now that we're a little ways into the panel, I'll say we vetted him. We know his background. We know some of what he's done, some of which he can't talk about, and we know that he will add a certain perspective to the panel. So we were fine with that, him coming on, claiming to be anything he wanted to be. <laughs> Within reason. I am a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> New battle cry. <laughs> okay. uh, I, Go ahead. As for the gentleman talking about being doxxed, I'm in the open. I've always been in the open. I'm not covert. I'm overt. So, with that. <clears throat> okay, and now everyone in the audience is going, who the fuck is that anyway? We still <laughs> <laughs> I'm overt, but I don't have my picture out there that often. And Raise your hand if you know choice. who this is. Four, five, six, yeah. So you're yeah. still masked. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm still masked. So in yeah. short, and, and that's why it's such a great question, is mask or no mask, it doesn't really matter, you know? It's more about the message, the content. So do you want to, you want to introduce yourself of, to the audience? What's that? Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh. Uh, I go by the name Cryptia. I have a blog on WordPress. Um, I've been blogging about LulzSec and Anonymous for quite some time. Uh, they know who I am. Um, I have treaded the line where I say to them, hey, you want to out people for doing bad things? Cool. But do it right. Stop this crap where you're just, you know, SQLing, taking down, you know, data that's unimportant. Your last dump that I looked at, the, uh, the Mantech dump, one SBU document. See, you know, sensitive but unclassified. You can get it with Google. In short, he's saying you're a bunch of pussies for that one. And I did say that in the blog. <laughs> um, so learn your target. Know what they're doing. Really, my, one of my last posts, I said, look, the real dirt has only come out from insiders. You know, you had the Pentagon Papers, you had Deep Throat, 
And now you got Manning. Manning. The source, not the movie. Yeah, not the movie. Uh, so you, you've got people in the know who have access to very dirty things, who decide to speak power to truth and release that information. Now, in Bradley's case, I think from the transcripts that I've seen, he was, is mentally unbalanced to a certain extent because of all the crap he's gone through. Going into the uh, military was a bad idea with where he wanted to go with his life, with reassignment. So he had a lot of pressure. And trusting that piece of shit Lamo was another and trusting royal it. screw up. However, the collateral murder thing, the video, very important to be out there because there's a lot of shit that's gone on over in the med that we don't know about. And that's just one tidbit. But that, out of all the dumps, all the cables and stuff, that was the most important thing. The rest of it, unimportant to me. Sure, there's backbiting between the United States and other countries. We deal with people we don't like. We have to. That's just the nature of the game. So if you're going to do this and you're going to find the real dirt, then find the real dirt, vet it, and give it to the papers what WikiLeaks wanted to do and did before the cult of Julian. Real quick, building on that, and going back to the building a better anonymous, which I wonder if we can do that as a consulting gig, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, releasing $250,000. I've already reserved the better anonymous domain, by the way, so. <clears throat> okay, quick, is there a lawyer to trademark this? <laughs> um, you know, Releasing 250,000 cables is really cool, but it's also kind of hurting your cause. You know, there's so much noise there, and there's so many pointless documents. Um, one of the better things they could have done is to actually go through and handpick the top 10, top 50 or whatever, put them out one a day or something. You know, we used to have, like, the HP bug of the day. Right, well, right you know, leaked cable of the day. Month of browser bugs, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you turn it into this kind of campaign, but you also focus on the big ones, you know, the collateral damage. Um, you know, any of the other specific cables that really out terrible things happening that the public should know about. Yep. And here's a little key for you, all you lulzies who want to do this. How do you know you have the real dirt? Right. How do you know you're not getting disinformation? Yeah, we've already shown that companies are out there doing disinforma uh, disinformation campaigns. You know, has Anon or Lulz fallen into one of their traps? Mm -hmm. Have we now been fed a bunch of shit made up by the companies that we think we know something about? Hmm. Okay, but let, let's, let us not let H.B. Gary off the hook here, right? So, um, you know, if... Hey, with, with friends like these, who needs enemies, right? <laughs> I, well, actually, I want to make a point so, about this. Wait, I mean, okay. the... We feel so powerless against this nameless, faceless flash mob, right? That instead of focusing on, you know, the actual adversary community, we're fighting with each other because we can, right? I mean, it's almost a Streisand effect. The act of trying to intimidate Aaron off stage, such that you don't draw attention, has drawn so much more attention. I've had five people come up to me saying, guess who my next target is? It's H.B. Gary. Now, I'm not suggesting that, but people I are already am. thinking it, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, we, they just put a big target on themselves in the effort to suppress good guys talking about good guy stuff. Or even going after Rafalos at Black Hat for taking a picture of somebody who had the anonymous mask near their booth. You know, they freaked out, chased him down. That's right, that's right. Okay, let me ask you, I mean, you, you, I think uh, uh, what we've heard you say is, look, what, what, it, what came out in the H.B. Gary emails was business as usual within the Beltway or elsewhere. The stuff has been going on for years. It's, it's actually a big industry. Um, should we conclude from that, that then that, that there was nothing untoward that H.B. Gary and Aaron Barr hadn't crossed a line or, or were not proposing to cross a line? If you're not pissed off about it, there's a problem. Yeah, they, exactly. they definitely crossed the line. I think line. I am pissed off about it. <laughs> you know, that's funny, because when Aaron was on the panel, we weren't going to go there, but he's not here anymore. Yeah, no, yeah, so H.B. Right. Gary and Aaron Bard, they crossed the line, but my point is that, yeah, that's business as usual for dozens of companies out there. 
you know? And even then, how many companies unrelated to that entire field of, you know, information gathering and open intel, how many of these other companies have ethical lapses? You know, if you need to be reminded, once again, attrition errata, we keep a list of shit like that. And when you start going down this list and you realize it's like page down, page down, page down, what the fuck is this, you know? And it goes back a long way. And that represents literally 10 minutes of work a week because we're busy doing other stuff. What happens if we actually built a real timeline? Every company that you do business with, they've done something shady in the past. And odds are, they've done something shady in the past three months. So, but just in case people don't know, you're the journalist in the room with all the facts. So, Paul, <laughs> it was the Chamber of Commerce thing that really tor torqued people, right? So can you give like a 30, 60 second overview of what was perceived to cross a line? Uh, what happened with the Chamber of Commerce or the emails that came out is it is that um, the uh, law firm of Hunt and Williams, which was representing the Chamber of Commerce, okay, um, we have 10 minutes, uh, the law firm that was representing the Chamber of Commerce was working with Themis, which was Team Themis, which is a, a name that represented Palantir, H.B. Gary, and Barrico, um, to research what the Chamber of Commerce thought was a um, basically a corrupt organization that the SEIU and uh, Think Progress and um, Change to Win were engaged in, you know, uh, criminal activity basically to try and undermine uh, some of the Chamber of Commerce's uh, uh, members, uh, and they wanted you know, uh, to use the tools of Palantir, uh, kind of data correlation tool, and HB Gary's uh, open source intelligence, and Barrico, uh, to try and reveal that. Of course, they're not the Justice Department, so even if they had figured out that it was, you know, a, a RICO violation, I'm not sure it was up to them to prosecute it. Um, but that was, that was what they brought to Aaron and brought to these companies to say, we have a problem and we're looking for your help with it. But I'd like to remind you that October Surprise and some of the things that uh, Karl Rove pulled are en masse in our mainstream government. So, and these are against the other party. Okay. So, uh, we understand the Chamber of Commerce thing. Um, I guess, did, 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 the, um, did the mainstream media get it wrong? I mean, did, did we in the press, were we too willing to um, buy anonymous's interpretation yeah, right. of what was in those emails um, were we and would we have felt differently if instead of the Chamber of Commerce um, it was a plan uh, by a uh, politically left-leaning or progressive group to interview you know to investigate co uh, co coach or cock industries and and um, uh, Americans for prosperity and 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 some of the groups that that have uh, you know probably this audience uh, generally more up in arms. I mean, w was our feelings about this tempered or colored by who was being, in, you know, who was on the, on the, uh, who was behind the, the law firm, who was paying for this, and, and what the mission was? Because Aaron has always said, I would have done it for anyone. I, you know, yeah, sure, Chamber of Commerce, but I would have done it for, uh, you know, Greenpeace or uh, you know, PETA or, you know, it, it didn't matter. I mean, it was just they were a customer. He's client agnostic. Client agnostic, right. Everybody's, all, their money's all green. Does it matter? Did the press get it wrong? I, I think you can generically say yes and no. You know, the, the press is kind of a nebulous group like Anonymous. I mean, some of the journalists, I, I think, go, uh, at least got it right and or put a fair perspective on it. And some of them, you know, sensationalized it. You know, uh, I think he's right. I mean, 60 Minutes is doing a long piece on the whole thing right now. It's going to come out in the fall. Um, Huffington Post is doing some investigative journalism on this. There's a couple stories being done, and I've personally, there's two scary things here. I've personally seen evidence that they've been manipulated on the narrative. They're being socially engineered trivially, <clears throat> so the press is becoming an asset of the, the lull sec and the anti sec. I've also seen that if you are trying to be an anonymous, a true, the word truly anonymous source to the press, um, I accidentally socially engineered out their sources without trying, right? So um, I think right now it's probably asymmetrically in favor of Anonymous uh, because the press doesn't have the filter or the, some press do, some of the better journalists in this trade space do, but for the most part they're being like played like a fiddle. Okay. Um, do, do, like, or, like, 
do organizations have a right, um, you know, let's kind of step into uh, the Chamber of Commerce issues, do they have a right to protect themselves from, from damaging or illegal activity? Uh, in the same way that uh, nations do, uh, the United States. So we're not, we're not going to argue that the United States has the right to have cyber offensive capabilities. Do corporations have the same right? This is why I'm really pissed off that uh, H.B. Gary Federal lawyer to Aaron off the stage because he had a couple really cutting questions. He had a couple really excellent points. And there is a, a chance now to finally have a discussion about what is lawful for defending your own interest. You know, how far can you take it? If someone breaks into my home physically in my state, I can shoot and kill them. We, are, we have almost no ability to fight back, to hack back, to do any sort of forensics. We don't have the laws have not caught up with that yet. So I, I liked the forcing function of this particular case because it asks us, and it might start challenging the discussion of what is lawful hack back. You know, and because there aren't laws, there's a lot of gray area and ambiguity, and maybe if you consult with your own internal counsel, maybe you should start uh, stretching that ambiguity right now because we cannot withstand an attack on pure passive defense. We are getting our asses kicked. Others? Nation states have rules that they've set up. Corporations are corporations, but they've recently, well, I don't know how recently the ruling was, but they're considered personal entities, a single entity that can be treated as a person. You know, that whole thing with the uh, Supreme Court recently about you know, money and advertising and all that. So if you as a person are hacked and you hack somebody back and you're caught, are you just going to say, oh, well, you know, they attacked me and I, virtual castle law, it's not going to work. So no, they didn't have the right to do that. Take a look at uh, offensivecountermeasures.com. Um, some of the stuff Paul Akam is doing, John Strand's been doing. Um, they're not saying these things are legal, but they're, we're going from purely only defense to maybe unlawful offense, and there's a continuum there of active defense, and there's some things where there's a lot more you probably could do, and if you get some legal coverage in advance, you could probably stretch that a little further. Uh, and also, let me reiterate for the people who came in later, we are doing a question and answer session immediately following this in Pavilion Room 4. Uh, also, I'm, I'm looking on Twitter for questions. Uh, I think the hashtag is TPanel. <laughs> Thank, thanks for breaking it, Jack. <laughs> Twitter's broken again. Uh, well, if it, if it comes back up, uh, T panel is a hashtag, and just uh, send, send me your questions. I will be checking it between here and the and the uh, Pavilion Four. Um, let me let me ask you: Is is anonymous uh, protecting us? Is anonymous standing up for us, or is anonymous terrorizing us? And I guess one question I would ask to the audience is: How many people here feel like they would feel safe? taking a public position in a blog post, uh, quoted in a news article, being critical of, a, uh, of Anonymous, being critical of their actions. And uh, how many people would feel safe doing that, like that wouldn't result in them getting attacked? Are you sure you're not sticking your penis in a hornet's nest? <laughs> right. Sorry? Well, safe meaning you don't feel like you would, you don't worry that you would be retaliated against. Yeah. Okay. So, so Uh-huh. Respect them. Respect them. Okay. What if you do choose not to respect them? Well, as an example... Why can't you be respectful? I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's a... disagree, well, and that, okay. Real quick, that's what I mean. Some of the stuff that I've written has been like that, where I say, hey, you know, overall they're doing some good, but this is where they need to improve. This mm -hmm. was, like, really lame. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it turns into constructive criticism, and they haven't attacked us. And, you know, like, for example, Lolsec, they were retweeting one of my articles saying, oh, look, you know, this is a, a good write-up. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that while many people say, oh, well, they're just, you know, wild, crazy kids, no, they have perspective, too. They understand that, you know, what they're doing could be better, and, you know, they're not going to lash out just at anyone. They're probably going to go after the people that uh, attack them needlessly or say something that's just really stupid. Yeah. yeah. And I, when I had that thing up there, I'm not saying we're not, we shouldn't have this role at all. I'm not saying that at all. There's a real opportunity that if wielded properly, this power could do a lot of good. There's also the opportunity that if wielded poorly, it's going to cause the very things we claim we don't want. Right? So um, it's a complex system. And when you poke here, something happens. The question is, are you poking here to cause the right things to happen? Or are you going to end up uh, 
in bad places. Okay. It wasn't about eliminating anonymous. It was about building a better one. Right. And I, I ask that as an as a open question. I mean, I've certainly written about anonymous and I've written critically about anonymous and, and I haven't been attacked. And, and I think yeah. a lot of journalists, journalists could say the same thing. So I'm, I'm not saying it because I, I have an opinion about what the answer is to that question. But Right. Right. right, and, and that goes back to my point. Right. You know, they'll go after the ones that say really stupid things, and the rest, it, it's like, well, yeah, that's how journalism works. Right. <clears throat> Well, and, and, to, and to the point here, you know, we've only, you know, I'm sorry, they've only attacked two news organizations. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, if you're Armenian, you know, we, we've only attacked two Armenians, and then one was this guy, and the other was that guy, and, you know, so if you're Armenian, you probably don't have to worry. Um, you know, an attack's an attack. But uh, I think I'm getting the big DEF CON yeah. X, uh, which means we're out of time. But I thank you very much for uh, coming today, and um, question and answer panel follow in uh, Pavilion 4.